Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in the studio, and uh, via uh, Zoom is my colleague and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. Sorry, guys. Uh, apologies to the audience. I couldn't be with Jimmy in the same spot because of some of... Uh, Benny, you can hit the hit the uh, siren. I was I was with Fox News all day who are in Detroit shooting a new Jimmy Hoffa documentary. So I've been with them the last two days and I couldn't make it to the uh, to to our our OG ground zero over at uh, Benny's house. So the command center, the command center. So I just want to thank everyone for for watching and listening. Please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our podcast and spread the word on social media. We really appreciate that. That's really important. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, so we always appreciate your support. Uh, we're super excited for this episode. Episode we have our, our, one of our returning champions, I would say, uh, Michael Francis, the legendary Michael Francis, is with us again. He's been on our show before, and uh, welcome, Michael. Uh, good to be back, guys. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's really yeah, an honor, Mike. Uh, I, I can't tell you how. Uh, grateful we are you you were you know you were one of our first guests in the infancy of this and just having you appear is is just tremendous you know a tremendous co-signing for our for our uh you know our bona fides and and we we pay homage to people like you and your father who uh were the real ogs i appreciate that guys but hey my pleasure you guys yeah We appreciate that. We, uh, um, Michael was uh, one of our first big guests back in the day. He was on not long ago to talk about his appearance in Detroit. So if people, audience members want to dig into the archives, you can listen to some of our earlier episodes with Michael. And, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Michael when he was in Detroit. He, he appeared at Andiamo's and, uh, he was talking about his new book, mafia democracy, uh, but also talking about his life and, um, it's just a real uh, fun evening to go see Michael during one of these speaking events. So before we get into you know some of the other stuff we're going to talk about with you, I believe you have a, an event coming up in in Ohio that's similar to your Detroit appearance. Do you want to uh, talk to us about that for a moment, Michael? Yeah, it's on uh, June 24th, and it's going to be in Lorain, Ohio, which is, I understand is about 20, 25 miles outside of Cleveland, I believe. And uh, it's going to be a great event. You know, it's a nice theater. Uh, from what I understand, it's uh, it's got a lot of uh, uh, lineage, a lot of heritage about it. So I'm excited to be there. And uh, tickets are selling well, from what I'm told. And uh, we're going to have a great night. You know, we talk. I tell them a little bit about my life. I educate them a little bit about, you know, what uh, my former life was really all about. Tell them what I'm doing today. We do a Q&A, and that's always the best part. Get a lot of Jimmy Hoffa questions, especially when I'm in and around the Detroit area. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a great time and, uh, we signed some books. We do a VIP meet and greet afterwards and, uh, everybody seems to enjoy themselves. I've been doing this quite some time and I enjoy it. I love interacting with people and it's uh, just going to be a great night. Yeah, it was a lot of fun at the appearance in Detroit. So I recommend people take advantage of this. And, um, Michael's a true gentleman too. Like, um, when he's signing the books, you could tell that if he could, you'd say you'd sit there all night with everyone. I mean, you could tell that you were really genuine about it. And I've talked to, you know, you know, Chris and some of your people and they're like, they're the ones that put the parameters on your appearances, because otherwise you'll 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 stay there as long as it takes to talk with your fans. And I, I just thought that was really cool. You weren't like rock star about it at all. You were really down to earth and just a nice guy. And you could tell everyone was enjoying themselves. Well, thank you. You know, and, and uh, I've been doing this a long time and I had an experience once in Chicago. I spoke at a uh, it was actually a church event and uh, it was a big church. Uh, the the congregation uh, was about twenty five thousand people. And after I spoke, the, the line to uh, sign books uh, was about five hours long and people were actually waiting and everybody had left. And I, I told my crew, I said, listen. If these people can wait online for five hours, then we're going to stay here and and sign the books. And that was early on in my my speaking career. And and I just learned if people want to wait, I I think we owe it to them to be courteous because they mean well and they get excited about it. And I've been doing that, you know, for my whole speaking career, which is almost a little over 20 years now. So uh, and yeah, I enjoy it. People, uh, you know, they mean well and they get excited and, uh, you know, it means a lot to them. So uh, why not? 
Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And and, and uh, I hope uh, uh, people take advantage of this and visit the uh, uh, go see you in Cleveland. Um, so speaking of Cleveland, um, just wondering uh, what like in terms of what you're going to talk about. I know you're going to talk about your life, but when you're at an event, you also try to give it some local flavor and and talk about some of your knowledge and experiences and interactions with that local familia. And so can you give us a little preview of maybe some of the things that uh, you find interesting about Cleveland or some of the uh, interactions that you had with the Cleveland family during your uh, time in, in, the, in the life? Yeah, well, you know, Cleveland is one of those cities that, you know, it's not really talked about when you think of, you know, Cousin Oster in this com- country, obviously, you think of New York, you think of Chicago right away, sometimes Kansas City, Tampa, maybe New Orleans, uh, Detroit. And Cleveland comes to mind, but it's not really spoken about that much. And it's got a great history, I think. Uh, well, it depends how you look at it. I mean, it's got a good history in my former life of, of some pretty substantial people being involved. Al Capone used to visit there quite a bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the lore. I met a few guys from Cleveland. Uh, when I would visit my dad, he was in prison in Leavenworth. And a few of the more prominent guys, I won't get into it now, uh, I met in the visiting room, got a little friendly with them, actually visited Cleveland uh, and met with one of them at one point in time. So we're going to be talking about that and Little Italy. I mean, I've never been to Little Italy there, but, you know, I put out that video and it was so nice. A number of people from uh, some of the restaurants in town contacted me and wanted to host me for dinner and uh, really, you know, offered to, uh, you know, to uh, have me come and just, you know, open their doors to me. So there. Uh, You know, I think there's a museum there that uh, people uh, reached out to us also. So I'm looking forward to spending an extra day there, going down to Little Italy, meeting some people and, you know, just enjoying the uh, the culture and and the scene as it is today. Michael, um, I I don't want you to give away too much of what you're going to talk about in June, but you were you were a young up and comer in the 70s when the Cleveland family started to implode. Um, I believe the, the, the war there between the Italians and the Irish, which is just really fascinating. It's like something out of a movie script. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that was happened during prohibition. It, it really didn't, other than this one situation in Cleveland, you really didn't have Irish and Italian uh, squaring off against each other. But in Cleveland, you did in, in from about 1976 to 78, uh, you had a, an all-out war, and some of those guys were actually taking counsel in New York City, not with the Columbos, but I believe with um, some of the Genovese uh, and some of the Gambinos. But were you aware? I mean, do you, do you remember in the 70s hearing that in Cleveland they're blowing people up in cars and the Irish are trying to take over for the Italians? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, there was so many uh, car bombings back then, and like I said, uh, during that time, my dad was in Leavenworth from 70 to 75. Oh, and then, I thought you were talking about later on. You're talking about back no, in the 70s. Yeah, I'm talking back in the 70s. And then okay. from 75 to 80, he was in Atlanta. But uh, a couple of guys from Cleveland were in there, and we were talking about it in the visiting room. So, yeah, I was well aware of it. And it's true. I mean, you know, normally, you know, at least you go back to the days of Prohibition when everybody was warring with everybody. But uh, after Lucky, you know, put the commission together, you didn't see much of that. You didn't see families uh, warring among themselves. You know, that that, that doesn't happen. Whenever there's a, a war in our life, it's always a civil war and it's always over leadership. You know, normally a power struggle. Uh, but back then it was out of the ordinary that the Irish really, uh, you know, they, they, they went to battle. A lot of guys got killed. And uh, we know some of the big stories there. Some of the guys, you know, again, I won't mention their names now. I'm going to save it. Uh, but that was, uh, that was a unique situation. And yes, it did bleed into New York because you got to understand the real seat of power for Cosa Nostra in this country really was in New York. I mean, we had five members on the commission. Genevieve's family, very powerful back then. And uh, I remember Fat Tony was, uh, was pretty much the acting boss, him and Chin. And uh, they called the shots or they, they had a lot of influence throughout the entire country. And they did intercede uh, in Cleveland at that time. Well, I think there, in just a little tidbit, I don't know if people know this, but you had both sides of that war doing business 
in New York with the five families because Danny Green, who was the leader of the of the insurgency that was the boss of the loosely coined Irish mafia or the they called themselves the Celtic Club or Celtic Club. But Danny Green was in some uh, wholesale meat and uh, deals with Paul Castellano, who was the boss of the Gambinos at the time. And so it wasn't just Jimmy Licavoli and his guys going to New York to take counsel. You also had the other side, Danny Green's going to meet with Castellano. Um, and I think if, if Green hadn't have been murdered in 78 in Cleveland via a car bomb, I think there was some talks that Castellano was going to draw him to New York and they were just going to kill him in New York. Yeah, I mean, he, he was definitely going to go one way or the other. Uh, he was a renegade. And, you know, listen, bottom line is, um, you know, we stick together when it comes to that. You know, even if we're not too pleased with the family that might be involved in the war, we're going to stick together. We stick with our own at that point. Uh, you know, we got involved in New York with the Westies, uh, right. a big Irish group, but we worked with them. They worked with us. And uh, I was pretty close with one or two of them there. One's doing life in prison right now. But, um yeah, I mean, Danny Green, he he stepped over the line, no doubt. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Michael. I, I mean, I, I still want to talk about Cleveland, but just speaking of Irish gangsters in general, obviously you're known for you had some lucrative partnerships with with Russian uh, mobsters. But I was going to ask you about the the Irish in New York during, you know, during your heyday. Um did you know guys like Jimmy Burke or uh, obviously Henry Hill? You're in the movie. Michael's in the, in the movie. Yeah. Goodfellas. So he's yeah, in that um, famous for people that don't course. know. He's in that famous scene where they're introducing <laughs> all of the members of the crew when they go to the Bamboo Lounge and they say, this is Mikey Francisi. <laughs> yeah, cl- classic scene. So did you you mentioned the Westies. Did you interact with some of the other Irish guys like like Jimmy Burke or Henry Hill? Well, I knew Jimmy and Henry both very well. Uh, Henry, I got to know uh, during that uh, whole Boston uh, college scam when he was uh, working there. He he uh, he gave me some information. I made a couple of bets, made a few bucks with him. Uh, so I knew him quite well. He was, uh, you know, he, Henry was always in trouble, honestly. He, he never looked as good as he did in Goodfellas, I can tell you that. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was very close with Paul Ivario. He was out on Long Island and I can tell you so many incidents that occurred with Henry Hill. Uh, but Jimmy, I, I knew fairly well. As a matter of fact, uh, he did me a real solid. Uh, when I finally went to prison, uh, when they were transporting me back to California, they brought me um, into Lewisburg Penitentiary. And they had opened up the basement at that time because the basement was condemned, but they opened it up because they had an overflow of inmates and they had to put them somewhere. So, you know, the feds, they don't care. It's condemned. They put you in there. And uh, the night I got there, uh, one of the COs called me. He says, I-, I need you to go into the bathroom. And I said, what for? He said, just go in the bathroom. So I go in the bathroom and I go by the, uh, the window. And, you know, just like in the movies, a pillowcase comes down on a, on a string or a rope. And uh, I open it up and there's cigarettes and coffee and everything that you need in there, you know. And there were a big note on there that said, love Jimmy, anything you need, let us know. They were all upstairs, you know, so many of us were there. So uh, it was funny because uh, they had two phones, only two phones, and the phones were active every other day. They'd be shut off one day on the next. And for me, when I was in prison, all I cared about was staying in touch with my family, my wife, and my kids. So I said, man, there's 250 guys down here with two phones every other day. We're not going to get any time. So I went over, there was a, a gang in there that kind of controlled everything. And I went over to him and I said, who's your leader over here? So he said, he pointed him out. I said, bring him in the bathroom. I want to talk to him. So he comes in. I open up the pillowcase because I didn't smoke and I didn't eat any of that stuff. I said, here you go. I said, I got cigarettes. I got smokes. Anything that you want. I said, you got. Just let me know. I said, but that one phone belongs to me. And he said, you got a deal. And that was it. So Jimmy kept sending me stuff. I was in there for about four months before they took me out. But at least I had to use the phone all day, every other day. So it was great. Those, yes. little, things, those little things mean a lot in there. Trust me. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could imagine. Um, 
Um, I, I just want, I wanted to ask you something else about the, the Westies and see what you think, because I, I, I know you like to talk about the culture of um, the life, not not just, you know, the, the crimes and the rackets, but the culture. And uh, one thing I read about the Westies was that when um, they were working so closely with the Italians like yourself and others that um, I think it was Jimmy Coon and Scott can correct me or not. But Jimmy yeah, Coon, it he, he it got to the point where he was so close with the Italians that he started wearing silk suits and pinky rings and hanging out in Brooklyn. And my understanding is that some of the rank and file Westies, some of the the old school Irish guys hoods in, in uh, Hell's Kitchen started to resent that, that, that Jimmy Coonan uh, started to forget that he was Irish. Uh, you have any uh, thoughts? I, mean, I always think that's kind of an amusing story. I don't know if it's true, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, Michael. Well, the fellow that I mentioned, you know, early on, I said I knew one of them. It was Jimmy Coonan. I knew him quite well. <laughs> okay, okay. And a uh, real guy, good guy, tough guy, no doubt about it. And, yeah, he was close to us. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, yeah, there was some friction. You know, he had some resentment in, uh, with Mickey Featherstone, and they had their their falling out. But, um, you know, uh, they were a good crew. I can tell you that. And we used them for various things, uh, you know, uh, different things that we had to get done. So. Uh, but yeah, you know, listen, the, the street life is is crazy. You know, there's a lot of treachery in that life, a lot of jealousy and envy. Uh, you can't avoid it, uh, no matter who you are. If you're doing well in that life, you always got to watch yourself. You got to be very smart and intuitive. You know, know your surroundings, uh, know who you got to deal with, know who's looking at you. It's, uh, it's a tough life in that regard, but you can navigate it. I did. I, I love quoting uh, my one of my mentors. Uh, George Anastasia, I, I think he was so succinct with this little blurb of his where he said, you know, in, in the world of the mafia, you don't have to worry about the double cross. You got to worry about the triple cross and the quadruple cross. So, you know, who your enemies are and who your allies are can oftentimes, you know, blur. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you got to be aware. You got to, you know, in a case like mine, I mean, I became a major target of law enforcement from day one because my dad was so high profile. And, uh, you know, I had 18 arrests. I had seven indictments, two federal racketeering cases. I was constantly under investigation. At one point in time, they had a, a 14 agency task force that had band together that would meet in a courthouse in Long Island in Uniondale uh, twice a month. And their whole objective was to put me in jail forever. So you got that to deal with. And then you got, you know, the guys on the street. You know, I was one of the younger guys and you know, I was doing pretty well. I was making a lot of money. I had my own plane. I had a helicopter. I had a lot of guys. I had the Russians involved with me. And the old timers resent that. You know, they really do. So you had to be you had to know how to use diplomacy. You had to uh, learn how not to rub people the wrong way. And you had to keep your ego in check. Extremely important because that's what gets you in trouble in that life in a big way. Got to keep yeah. it in check. To, you know, to, 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 or Jimmy, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say one thing, uh, Michael, you mentioned during uh, your talk in Detroit, and I, I don't want to uh, spoil too much for the, the audience in Cleveland, but you mentioned that that was especially important lesson you learned uh, before you went to prison, that your father was the one who reminded you that that would, that he told you it was inevitable you're going to go to the joint at some point. It's just a, ma just a matter of time in our life you know, that, that that's going to happen and that you need to, uh, to keep your ego in check when you're in prison. If you could, uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, my father told me, he said, Mike, three words are going to save you a lot of headache and aggravation in prison. He said, please, thank you. And excuse me. <laughs> and he said, you know, you bunk into somebody, excuse me. You want to cut it, uh, somebody on the line, please. Do you mind if I get in there? You know, I got a friend there. And then, of course, thank you. Somebody's polite to you or gives you something. Thank you. And the reason for that is because so many guys in prison that never got any respect on the street, they want respect in there because they want to show off to their you know, friends that they're somebody. And so for the littlest nonsense, you know, I've seen so many things happen in there because people have an arrogant attitude. Listen, John Gotti got beat up in there. You know, uh, Carmine Persico, you know, had his issues in there. They don't care who you are. When guys are doing life in prison, what do they got to lose? You know, they don't care. So you got to you got to be mindful of that. I never had a problem, never had an issue at any time in prison. And for that reason, you know, you just uh, 
The only time I had a problem, I'll be honest with you, was with my own guys. You know, mm. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I could say Pete Milano. You know, Pete, you know, his father <laughs> came out. The boss of L.A. that eventually, <laughs> or that whose father was the conciliary of Cleveland. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I got along with Pete. He was doing time in Terminal Island where I was, and he was kind of, I don't know if you can really call him the boss of L.A. because they didn't really have a right. uh, not right. there. But, you know, he was he was a lead guy. So him and, uh, you know, Sam Sorrentino, really nice guy, um, you know, out of uh, New Orleans or had good contacts in New Orleans. And it was about maybe six, seven, eight guys in there. Right. And, you know, I used to when I got out on the yard because they tried to lock me down a bunch of times when I was out on the yard, I used to play softball. I used to walk the track. I wanted to make my time go. And a lot of the black guys, you know, they would play ball and I'd hang with them and, you know, we'd have a good time. So one day Pete calls me and he says, Mike, I want to see you. He sends somebody down. So I go see him and I said, Pete, what's up? He's Mike, how come, you know, you don't hang with us? He said, you know, you're, you're always courteous. You say hello. And it, we don't hang out with us. We always see you on the yard. You're playing ball. You, you know, you hang out with some of the black guys. He said, why? I said, Pete, very simple. I said, first of all, I do my own time. I said, second of all, you guys hang out, tell war stories and play cards. I have no interest in that. I said, that's not how I do my time. And he says, well, you know, you're hanging around with these kind of guys. I said, Pete, let me remind you of something. I'm in jail because of my Italian friend that became a, an informant and informed against me. So don't talk to me about other guys. Um, and when we settled, it was nice after that, you know. And uh, uh, But, I, you know, I, I, I let him know that. He was a nice guy, but he was different than, uh, you know, guys that I was used to back in New York. But uh, – but, you know, we got along. I don't want you to think we didn't. But, you know, things happen in there and you got to just, you know, you got to state your case and, and speak up for yourself in a nice way, politely. There was no reason to be disrespectful. I don't disrespect anybody, you know, unless uh, they give me a reason to. Other than that, you know, with me, you got respect until you until you don't. When, when, when you were you were making a lot of moves out in California before you got locked up, yeah. were you, did you have to go kind of check in with Milano and Jimmy Gachi and all those guys? You know, we had a, a, a rule in New York. Whenever you went to a city like Chicago, I had business there. I had to go in and I put it on record with my boss. And then I had to go and seek out the uh, the boss. You know, a message was sent. I went and seen him. And basically told him what I wanted to do and got his blessing or whatever, you know. Um, uh, but when we went to L.A., hey, do whatever you want. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah, yeah, that that. And my understanding is that a lot of New York guys were active out there from the different families. Pretty uh, much. Well. It was kind of virgin territory. You know, it was funny because uh, I loved it out here. You know, I'm out here now. I'm in I'm in Orange County, but I love it out here. And it was like, you know, just a whole different environment. I was in the film business. I had a lot of things going. And the guys in New York would say, Mike, how, how is California? I would say, terrible. Hard. <laughs> go there. The worst thing, I didn't want anybody to follow me out there. So I said, that was a bad place. You don't want to come out here. But uh, truthfully, it was, especially back then, it was really, really beautiful. It's nice now, but it was beautiful back then. Can I, can I segue back to Cleveland? Because I want to ask Mike, you know, kind of Monday morning quarterbacking or doing a uh, kind of a uh, 40 year later autopsy of a situation. I find it interesting when you when you're studying Cleveland. Yeah, you I mean, we already just we just talked about in the last five minutes. I mean, people, you had a lot of guys that weren't necessarily or that were kind of moving in and out of Cleveland, coming from other cities. Uh, Tony Milano, who was the conciliary of Cleveland sent his two boys, Carmen and uh, Pete, out to L.A. The guys that eventually took over the crime family when all of this um, tension erupted in the mid to late 70s were actually Detroiters that had come to Cleveland 20 years before that or 30 years before that. But Danny Green and, and, the, uh, and the Celtic Club or the, the Irish mob there, they were working in tandem with the Italians throughout the 60s and first part of the 70s. And then John Scalish, who was the longtime boss of Cleveland, uh, passes somewhat suddenly. Uh, he was having a, a, a surgery on his heart. And there was some debate or controversy about who he actually had named as his successor. It eventually became uh, Jack White or James Licavoli, Blackie, 
um, was a guy that again traced his roots back to Detroit. So us, uh, me and me and Jimmy have, have done a lot of research on, on his family. Um, but there's a lot of belief that Scalish actually didn't want uh, Jimmy Licavoli. That he probably wanted Angelo Leonardo, but uh, the the Jewish de facto conciliary uh, Macy Rockman was the one who was John Scalish's brother-in-law and had the one that had relayed the message to, to, to the rest of the family about who Scalish had named his replacement. Some people think Rockman lied and said it was Jimmy Licavoli when in fact it was Leonardo. But what happened, there's no debate about. Jimmy Licavoli was a lot of things. Um, he wasn't really boss material. And when he took over, he had a very difficult time navigating his new position. Um, and then all of a sudden, Danny Green and the guys in his camp who had been working very closely with the Scalish group. Um, and I think they had been dealing with uh, Scalish's underboss, Frankie Brancato. But as soon as James Licavoli takes over, his underboss, Leo Lips Mosheri, they cannot get along with Danny Green and everything falls apart really quickly. Do you, do you, I don't know how much you know about the history, but do you look at that and it's like, well, if a guy, Jimmy Licavoli not only wasn't someone who seems to be, a, or seemed to have been equipped to be a boss from everybody that I've spoken to and everything that I've read, Jimmy Licavoli didn't want to be a boss. So, I mean, do you look at that situation and think, well, maybe if, the power transition would have been different Then you wouldn't have had all of, all of the um, dust ups, which really, I mean, I know it was 40 years ago, but the Cleveland family never really recovered. I think from, from my research, I think there's still something there. I don't think it's defunct, but it's to say it's a shadow of its former self would be an, uh, offensive to shadows. Uh, so do you look at that situation and think, well, they just miscalculated on who they, put in the boss's seat? Well, listen, you know, first of all, the, you know, all over the country, it's a shadow of what it used to be. You know, the right. golden, the right. golden years of our life were from the fifties, right through the mid eighties. And then yeah. when the Rico statute came in, everybody went crazy. That was the end of the life as we knew it. Um, but listen, you know, leadership is everything. The wrong guys in the place. I mean, look, John Gotti, he was the wrong guy for that position. Not because he, he wasn't capable, because of the way he conducted himself. You can't, you can't be that much in the public eye. You just can't be. You don't only hurt yourself, but you bring people down with you. He didn't do it intentionally. You know, he wasn't looking to hurt. But, you know, that's why guys like Carlo Gambino and, and uh, you know, Frank mm -hmm. Costello, they tried to be as low key as they possibly could. And as a result, you know, they had some longevity in that life. But, you know, listen. You know, I don't know the intricacies about it, but leadership is everything in that life. It's everything. And it's leadership is everything everywhere. Let's face it. You know, you can be a boss. It doesn't automatically mean you're a good leader. Right. Not that position, but it doesn't mean you're going to, you know, you're qualified to deal with the family. It's, it's, it's very hard. It's a lot of work and a lot of knowledge to run a family. Trust me, you got all different crazy guys out there doing different things that you have to rein in. And look, I knew it just from, I wasn't a boss, but I had my crew and I knew, you know, just the 15, 18 guys I had around me, it was a lot of work. I would never want to be the boss. Never. Number one, you got so much exposure. Uh, and number two, it's a, it's a real hard job. Uh, yeah. Okay. You make money, but there's other ways, you know, so, I mean, I would have to say there was probably a dearth of leadership. Maybe things could have been avoided. But, you know, who am I to talk after the fact? You know, it's I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback because I'm not that familiar. But, you know, like every other city, Cleveland had its problems. Chicago had its problems. New York, obviously. Everywhere you go, we just uh, were devastated in many ways. Just and a matter of timing. Who lasted the longest? To your point about how Rico changed everything, again, just tie it right back into Cleveland, um, depending on what you consider uh, acting boss or real boss, uh, James Licavoli was the first official boss to be convicted under Rico. I know they got 
uh, Funzi Thierry of the of the Genovese, but I think there were some questions about whether Funzi was the actual boss or was he a front boss. But Jack White, aka James Licavoli, was convicted under the RICO Act, and it was really the opening of the both Thierry and Licavoli were the first two mob bosses to be uh, tried under or indicted under the Racketeering Influence and Corruption Act. And from that point on, you know, all bets are off. Yeah, well, it was devastating. You know, people say Gotti ruined the life. Gotti didn't help in many ways, but, uh, you know, it, it was Rico. Trust me when I tell you that. Rico created uh, more informants uh, that, that you can imagine. And at the end of the day, it's informants that pull you down. So um, it was devastating. Still is. Who was who was the uh, the the saying uh, the famous saying that uh, with Rico they can indict a ham sandwich? <laughs> who, was, who said that? I can't remember. It was somebody in the well, life. <laughs> yeah, I can't it, remember. It, it, it was actually a lawyer. I don't remember if it was Ray <laughs> Cohn or whatever. But yeah, they said a grand jury can indict a ham yeah. sandwich. Joey, Joey the clown Lombardo from Chicago was right. caught on a wire being like, yeah. you know, uh, you can in, you can indict a, a cheeseburger. <laughs> under the racketeering act and get a conviction. And then I think what well, it's, it's the, yeah, it's the grand only, jury was a ham sandwich. It's not the racketeering act. You know, the, uh, it's, it's the grand jury. I don't know. I, I would be, I would ask anybody to name one situation where a prosecutor brought a case to a grand jury and they didn't hand down an indictment. It doesn't happen. They do whatever the prosecutor wants. You know, it's, it's supposed to be a good system, but it's not. Because you don't have a lawyer in there. You can't defend yourself. Uh, if you go in there and speak on your own behalf, you're actually putting yourself in trouble. Um, it's, it's, a, it's not a good system. It's really not. Um, and again, I would ask if there's any lawyers listening or anybody out there, give me one situation where a prosecutor brought a case to a grand jury and the grand jury failed to bring back an indictment. Look, we just had it with Trump in New York. The biggest nonsense, ridiculous case you could imagine. Um, but of course, they, they hand down a, a, an indictment. It's just it's it's crazy. It's it's a silly system, but it is what it is. And if you're if you're the federal government and you're bringing a racketeering case, you have a ninety nine percent chance of conviction. I mean, it's uh, the, the the deck is stacked heavily against whoever the defendant is. And I'm I'm not passing judgment on it. I'm just saying that Robert Blakely wrote this law back in the early 70s. It took the government a good decade plus to understand how to use it. And now, you know, 40 years later, 35 years later, they're now taking this the same approach to busting the mob and they're going after, you know, politicians. I mean, in Detroit, we had Kwame Kilpatrick go down on a RICO case. He got the largest sentence ever uh, handed down in, in, a, in a political RICO. He ended up getting pardoned by Trump when Trump walked, uh, got out of office. I have my issues with that, but that will be that can, that can be said for another day. But Kwame Kilpatrick raped and pillaged our city uh, and probably killed two prostitutes, uh, strippers in the process of doing that or people loyal to him did so. Uh, and he got a 30 year sentence and ended up only doing about seven years, but uh, that's neither here nor there, but, uh, it happened in Chicago, uh, with two different governors, George Ryan and Rob Bogoyevich. It happened in Providence with Buddy Cianci. So the, the government has, has taken this RICO law to, that initially was made to go after the mob and now is, is going after, you know, other targets using it. So it's a very, very uh, uh, lethal it's weapon. Not, it's not now. They've been doing that since the beginning. Right. See, people don't understand. Whatever you weaponize the government, at some point in time, it's going to turn against you also. You know, they weaponize the government to now to go after their political enemies. They'll, they'll use RICO. But even before that, you know, there's a civil RICO statute. They were going after guys on Wall Street, mm -hmm. you know, to take your money. I mean, it's... Every time you give the government an inch, they want to take a yard and they'll never give it back. Never. And that's what people don't understand. You know, that's why, you know, we're in such a, a, a dangerous time in society right now, because the government is weaponizing the Department of Justice and law enforcement agencies 
to go after their political enemies. And you can't do that. That's not what this country is built upon. You don't, you know, the people in power are not supposed to weaponize, you know, the, the administration to go after their enemies. And that's what's happening. And listen, you know, whether Trump, Trump is going to be okay, whether he becomes president or not, he's got plenty of money. He's going to defend this case. He's going to be all right. You know, but what they did to him was horrible. Let's face it. I mean, they've been after that guy since 2016 because they don't like him because he's not, you know, one of the boys. He doesn't care about them. He didn't need them. He had his own money. And I believe the guy really wanted to do good for America. So what did they do? They come after him. I don't think anybody's been in there. Mob guys haven't been as investigated as much as he has. Yeah, but I, I got to tell you, I, I agree with you with what you're talking about, specifically with this case out of Manhattan. I don't disagree with you. But what I will tell you, putting my – I have a law degree, putting my lawyer hat on, Donald Trump has quite a bit of exposure and major issues coming down the line that have nothing to do with this Manhattan case. Because I, I, I predict he's going to be indicted another two or three times before the end of the year. And those was, cases could be a lot stronger than what listen, you have in Manhattan. If, if he violated the law and they have the evidence, he's like anybody else. You go after him and you do what you got to do. Uh, but until or unless that happens, uh, he, he's an innocent guy at this point. I don't know what he's done. You know, people are saying, well, he got away with so much in the past. Well, what does that have to do with anything? You know what I mean? You don't prosecute people today for what they got away with in the past that you couldn't prosecute for, uh, you know, at that time. That's not what the system is about. You know, I had arguments with people about O.J. Simpson and that whole case. And people say, well, everybody knows O.J. killed, you know, his wife and that and that young man. And I said, yeah, I believe that, too. I lived there. My kids used to dance with his his kids. I mean, we knew the story. And I believe that, you know, he was guilty. But the government didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And if the government doesn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, then a jury should acquit them. And that's the safeguard in our system. That's it. Well, it was, a brilliant, we, it was a brilliant defense by Johnny Cochran. Yeah. That was one of the greatest I mean, defense uh, attorney whatever. jobs ever. Yeah, I don't want to get into the intricacies of the case, but whatever. Yeah. They didn't prove their case. And if you don't prove the case, the defendant's supposed to go free. Our system is built upon that principle. You know, the government has enough weapons. They have enough, you know, weapons in their arsenal to go after somebody legitimately. And, you know, we used to tell guys on the street, FBI agents, listen, you got a job to do. You do your job. You're on one side. We're on the other. Just don't frame us. You get us. You get us. We got it. And there was no hard feelings. We understood that. But don't frame us. If you can't get us with all the weapons that you have in your arsenal and everything you got, then shame on you. You know, and on the flip side of that is I've had people, Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco is a good friend. I like him a lot. Only met him once on the street. Thank God for that, because he <laughs> may not be here. He was with his record of success. <laughs> but, you know, guys, ah, Michael, how can you be friends with that guy? He put so many guys away. I said, well, that was his job. I said, you're mad because he did his job better than we did ours. That was his job. He was an informant. He didn't flip. That was his job. That's what he took an oath to do. So he did it better than we did. What are you mad at? You know, and, and that's what I believe. And I'll stick to that principle. You know, to yeah, Mike's I, point about – sorry, Jimmy. Let me just make one point. To Mike's point about how the, the RICO Act has been – this isn't a brand new uh, approach about going after politicians. You know, the Cianci case was in the late 90s. So you're right. It's been, you know, 25 years of this. And that was the first time that they really – uh, nailed a uh, uh, a political leader, but they've taken that as as kind of entree now to to do what they've been doing now for the last twenty five years. But to your point, yeah, uh, and I know just as many retired FBI agents and retired DE agents than I know retired wise guys. And I'll tell you, there's really at the end of the day, there ain't that much difference between <laughs> the two the two groups of people. Well, I was going to uh, mention something, Michael. Uh, I, I think uh, a, a friend of yours, we, we interviewed uh, George Christie, uh, former Hells Angels uh, uh, member one time, and he, he was uh, mentioned that he was friendly with you. I think you guys did serve some time together. Yeah, and uh, uh, George is a great guy, too. And he, he said, um, to your point about civil liberties, he said, look, I, I'm not saying I'm a saint. 
if you can if you can catch me and if you can get me on what I did, then I'll do my I'll take my medicine. But don't manufacture evidence. Don't frame me because uh, yeah. that's not how the system is going to work. And I, yeah. I always thought that that was a fair uh, way of 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 framing it. Yeah, and to bring it back, listen, I went to I went to jail for a crime that I was guilty of. I pled guilty. I did my time. No hard feelings. The Giuliani case, when he indicted me, I had as much reason being on that case as you did. I had nothing to do with it. As a result, I was acquitted. But it cost me a couple of million bucks to defend myself and almost two years out of my life, you know, being on trial. The trial lasted several months and then defending, I mean, preparing for the trial before that. So, I mean, they get you one way or the other, but at least I had my freedom. But, you know, um, I want, I'm not saying he framed me. But the evidence was was nonsense. I shouldn't have been in that case. And, you know, as a result, the jury saw through it and we got acquitted. But, you know, if you're guilty, you're guilty. You know, you do your time. I was just going to ask, because I know we're, we're getting close on uh, time here. I wanted to ask you, Michael, back to uh, about the culture is, um, you know, you mentioned you worked with some Russian guys, you worked with some Irish guys. Um, you were in New York. That's the the sort of nexus of of, of the life. But obviously, there's guys in other families. You talk about L.A., Cleveland. What was your sense when you would meet a friend from Detroit, Cleveland, another familia? Um, did you view them as equals? Because I, I, I know you've had some interactions with Sammy the Bull. And and Scott had a conversation with Sammy the Bull. And, and Gravano's not here to defend himself. But, <laughs> but, but Sammy uh, was pretty condescending about non-New York just, families. I, I just said to him, I said to him the first, I, the first thing I, or one of the first things I said to him was like, did you know any guys from Detroit? And he says, Detroit, Michigan. Is that even in the United States of America? <laughs> yeah. So he was, so I was wondering, Michael, well, how did you, when, when you would meet, a, when you were in, in the life and you met a guy from another family, from another part of the country, how did, how did you, did you view them as like, this is a Michi Nostri. This is, this is our friend. Doesn't matter. A made guy is a made guy, regardless of where he came from. And, you know, I wasn't being condescending uh, of Pete Milano. He was a made guy, respected that. Uh, but you also speak your piece when you have to speak up, you know. I mean, he was the one that approached me. But no, I mean, look, I met a lot of guys in prison, too, from all over the country. And uh, as far as I was concerned, you're a made guy, you're a made guy. You 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 earn that respect uh, by getting your button. So, you know, look, Sammy is Sammy. He's a character in that regard. You know, he and I get along fine now. We had our uh, little skirmishes, but it didn't go anywhere. But, um, you know, if that's his attitude, what can I say? But, you know, Sammy, Sammy, at least now, I didn't know him well on the street at all. But at least now, he's come down to earth quite a bit, maybe when he's off camera, you know. He's got a great family. Um, I love his son. As a matter of fact, I was going to take his son away. If I said, hey, you report to me now. You don't report to your dad anymore. <laughs> and he, was, he was happy to do that, but uh, I'm only kidding. But, yeah. but, you know, look, no, a guy's a made guy regardless. Look, I, I um, one of my uh, cellmates was Rosario Gambino, who was a Philly guy, and he was related to Carlo. And, you know, we, we spent uh, quite some time together and, you know, gave him all the respect that uh, that he earned, you know, and he felt the same with me. So I don't differentiate because of a city or a family or anything. Now, look, obviously from New York, they look up to you as, well, you guys are from New York. You just, you just got that feeling that they were looking at you that way. So, um, but no, I, if Sammy said that, I, I disagree. Some of it's just scale, though, right, Mike? I mean, you, Michael, you have a situation in New York, at least if we're talking about the heyday, you're talking about families that had, you know, some of them had a thousand guys in it, 800 guys, a big family outside of New York. If they got a hundred guys, it's a big family. So, well, well, I mean, look, we had during my time in that life, we had 750 made guys right. that comprised all five families. The biggest families, you know, the Gambino and the Genovese family, they each had about 250, uh, 200, 250. And, you know, Bananos and us, we were smaller. We had 115 guys. Now we had a lot of associates, right? But you know, nobody had you know a thousand guys. I mean, I guess I was talking about the all of the yeah, all the I mean, made guys in New York City. Yeah, you know, again, yeah. 750. But it, it didn't matter. You know, 
I mean, look, our, I used to ask my boss, how come, you know, they got double the amount of guys we do? And he said, well, we go for quality, not quantity. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, Michael, uh, before we wrap up, uh, you want to uh, mention to our audience how they can find out more about your, your channel and your books and your website and, and uh, different, different ways to interact with you? Yeah, one thing I want to mention, you know, I've recently created a platform. Uh, it's called MobTiesVIP.com. MobTiesVIP.com. And uh, we have a platform there where we're really trying to do a lot of good for people. We're creating a lot of content. We're having a lot of Zoom calls. We're putting uh, meet and greet events together. And as a little secret surprise, I can let you guys in on it. Uh, Mike Tyson will be joining me shortly on that platform. We're going to be working wow. together. Mike is in a position now um, where he really wants to give back. He really, really does. He's very sincere about it, very genuine wants to use, you know, the benefit of his experiences throughout his life to help people. And we're joining together in that regard. And we're going to be announcing that soon. Um, but anybody that's interested, look, you know, men, men got to be men today. Uh, I, I can tell you that we're, we're helping a lot of guys. Anybody that's interested, mobtiesvip.com. Go in, take a look. No obligation, of course, but uh, we provide a lot of good resources for people. A lot of good men have jumped on board this. Uh, Chaz Palminteri is with me. A guy by the name of Tommy Matola used to run yeah. uh, Sony Records. Mariah. You don't Kelly. know who Tommy Matola is. Please yeah. Google him. This he's guy a big is deal. one of the <laughs> biggest power players in the music industry. Yeah, uh, big deal. He, he's a he's a he's almost in some ways bigger than the other guys you mentioned. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and uh, you know they all want to do the same thing. So we're we're really trying to help people, and uh, so far the reaction has been tremendous. And we're building and it's growing and uh, we want to become the biggest platform in the world that's known to be giving back and helping people. We have a charity that's involved with us. So, again, MobTiesVIP.com. Uh, my book, Mafia Democracy, you can go on Amazon. It's out there. You want a signed copy from me, you can go on any one of my web, my uh, social media sites. I think the book is available. Um, and really, that's it. Everything else is good. We got a TV series in development based upon my life that uh, I think they'll be in, making an announcement in the next several months. Um, everything else is good. I'm looking forward to being in Lorraine and uh, meeting a lot of people from Cleveland. I love the city. I've been there many times. Looking forward to Little Italy. And maybe you guys will hook up again and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll shoot the breeze some more. It's yeah, about- yeah. Next time you're in Detroit, Michael. Yeah, well, uh, and I'm in, always in touch with your camp, so uh, I, I would even look in, forward to that. It would be fun. Even Cleveland. I mean, depending on what I'm doing uh, that week, I mean, it's re- I, I I had uh, I hit the siren, Benny. My <laughs> my Netflix documentary, uh, White Boy, uh, was produced out of Cleveland, so I spent. And then the White Boy Rick film that I worked on was also shot in Cleveland, so I mm-hmm. got a a nice dose of that city from around 2017 to 2020. And I, I really fell in love with it. Yeah. Uh, and it's only about a week. I can get to Cleveland from Detroit in two and a half hours. So yeah, it's close. Uh, we, it's we close. I could potentially come out and, and see you. I just want to ask one more thing, not really relating to the life or anything, but one of the things I fell in love with, uh, with Mike's content, I want to see if you're still doing it so you can promote it. Uh, is you, was your movie reviews. Yeah. Are you, are you still dabbling in that? We're still doing them. Yeah. I got, I got a couple online now. We, we ran out of, you know, movies for a while. So, uh, but we're starting to replenish. We got more in the bank now. We're going to be doing that. I thought um, it was so great. I mean, for, yeah. to have someone like Mike be able to, Michael would be able to take you through the, the movies that he was um, analyzing and giving you, this is what, you know, this is the, the real, this is the, the fictional and then help you kind of m- meld those two worlds as a viewer to kind of understand um what's what was fiction and what was nonfiction. I, I love I love everyone I've watched. Well I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. So guys, yeah, um, listen, I appreciate it. I am coming to Detroit. I think we're doing uh the Detroit area two more wine tastings there at a couple of restaurants. I forget the name of the restaurants. Sometime in May, I believe. So um oh. if that happens we'll let you know. And I'm sure Chris yeah. will know about it. He'll he'll reach out to you. 
Yeah, please. And we'll promote it on our social media. Uh, please check out Michael's uh, content on YouTube. Please read his books. Uh, please uh, check out his website. He's the best. He's a superstar. Michael, we really appreciate your time. And uh, please uh, subscribe to our video channel, Original Gangsters Podcast. Thank you again, Michael. Good luck with everything. Have fun in Cleveland. Guys, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. And until the next time, take care. God bless. Thank you, Michael. Take All care, right. everyone.